Hey everyone, Kat Roche here, Major League Rugby Referee, and I am back to talk to you about the scrum. The scrum is one of the best parts of the game if you're a forward, uh, and one of the most confusing if you ever played in the back line or as a loose forward like I did. So today we're going to go over a couple of things in the scrum, what to look for, how to officiate the scrum, and most importantly, how to keep it a safe and fair part of the games for the teams to contest. Let's get started. So first, when we're going to talk about the scrum, let's talk about what is it. So in the simplest terms, a scrum is a set piece that's used to restart play. So if a ball's been knocked on or thrown forward, we're going to have to restart play with a scrum to the non-offending team. But it is also an area of contest. It's an area where both teams get to contest for the ball to try to win it back. So one team feeds the ball into the scrum, but the other team can still push forward and try to win that ball back. So when we're remembering the scrum is a restart, yes, but there's a lot more to it than just putting the ball in, getting the ball out and carrying on with the fun, exciting stuff and we've got to keep the scrum fair and contestable for both teams. What's our number one priority at the scrum? Well, try to answer that yourself, but it's actually one of our number one priorities in the game as a whole, safety. We've got to keep the players safe, particularly in the scrum when we can have up to a thousand pounds on either side pushing into each other. You've always got to keep your number one priority safety. So that being said, if you ever have an infringement on a scrum or the scrum is no longer safe, blow your whistle. It doesn't matter if you don't know what to do next, you don't know who the infringing team was, blow your whistle, get the players safe, and then reset. No one is ever going to fault you for trying to keep players safe. So don't put the pressure on yourself to get everything right, but remember our number one priority is always safety. Okay, so we've covered what a scrum is and the number one priority, so now we're gonna get into it. How do you set up a scrum, have a fair contest, and make accurate decisions? Well, it all starts with the setup. There's four main parts of the setup, and we're gonna go through each one. So part number one is alignment. First thing we're gonna do is make sure that everybody at the scrum is aligned in exactly the same, the right channel they should be, so they're not head on head. All right, so the first part of a scrum setup, we're gonna talk about alignment. This is getting every prop in their own channel so that when we set together, we don't have any head on head cut. What do I mean by that? Let's talk about it. We've got three people in the front row from each side. your loose head prop, your hooker, and your tight head prop. So on the opposite side, it's same but reversed. Now, when I talk about alignment, you're gonna make a mark as the referee in the center of the scrum, and you want both hookers to line up on that mark. A good rule of thumb is to have each hooker go to the left of your mark. If your hooker's right-footed, they're gonna have their right foot out in front of them. And if that right foot is to the left of the mark and the other hooker's right foot is to the left of the mark, they'll naturally set up off, or they'll naturally set up staggered. So off center of each one another. Then when the tight head and the loose head bind on, they naturally will also be off center. Now, how does that help? When the front rows come down together, they'll be in the gaps that they created. So nobody's head on head. What we don't want to happen is have the players try to occupy the same channels. And when they come down, they're going to be head on head. That means their angles are going to be off. So set your mark, take the hooker to the left of the mark, both hookers to their own left, and we'll be aligned in our own spacing. How does that look like with body position angles? Well, if that is the direction my player is going, so head, hips, 
They're all nice and straight. And they're all, not that much space, but they're all in their own gaps as opposed to head on head. That is what we don't want. That is what we do want. And that's gonna be your alignment. Now that we've covered alignment, we're gonna move into the next part of the setup. Space. So now everyone's aligned. Let's make sure that they've got the correct spacing so we're not too far apart or too close together. All right, we are on to space. So we want space between our front rows. How much space is enough space? Well, you're gonna kinda let the front rows dictate that for you. If you've got a nice stable scrum, and the front rows are happy with the space, if, even if you think it's too much, but you're getting a good outcome, that's fine. But if you think there's too much space and you're not getting a good outcome, you're not getting a stable scrum, then, then move them closer together and get less space. Why would a front row want more space? Because then they can really lean forward and get the hit on and put the other front row under pressure. The closer you keep them together, the less low to the ground they're gonna be able to get on that initial hit. So the closer together they'll be, theoretically, the more stable your scrum will be, but you'll also not be letting them contest the way they want to. So when we're looking for space, if that's the angle of my prop from the red team, so, head, hips, knees, feet, excellent. Going against, and we'll talk more about these shapes later, but we're just getting into it right now. When they crouch down, you wanna have their heads be ear to ear. So what does that look like? Heads, heads, heads. Heads, heads, heads. So when they crouch down, their heads are all ear to ear, spines nice and straight. This is what our picture is gonna look like. Now, if there's too much space, you could still get this picture theoretically, but one of these players could be overextended. And if you're gonna have a player that's overextended to show you that picture, you're not gonna have a very stable scrum. Likewise, if you have not enough space, then when that player crouches down, they're gonna be all crunched up and you don't want that either. So you wanna have enough space that you've got really strong body positions from your props when their heads are ear to ear on that set call. And that's how we talk about space. Awesome, now that alignment and space are dealt with, we're gonna go into the next step, stability. Everyone's set up in their own channel. We've got the correct spacing. Are they stable? We are into stability. We love a good stable scrum, but what does stability really mean? When I think of stability, I think that every player in the scrum has control of their own body weight. So my triggers are the feet aren't moving and they're not leaning into the other front row. So they can maintain their body weight and shape by themselves. So we all know a lovely engagement sequence in the scrum. You've got the crouch. On each call, what I'm looking for is stability. So on the crouch, you'll have the second rows readjust. Crouch, your front rows adjust a bit, Great, they've got their positioning, they're all settled, your second rows adjust. Okay, once everybody's stopped moving, we carry on to the next part of the sequence. Find, 
on the bind, your front rows are gonna bind up. Usually, your second rows are gonna get their feet up and behind them, and the front rows are gonna adjust their feet as well, so they're in what we talked about earlier, that nice pushing position, nice flat back, knees and feet out behind them. So they're gonna adjust to that on the bind. Now you wanna wait for all of that to happen before you move on to the set because there's a lot of forces changing in the scrum. As they're doing that, second rows are changing, flankers are tightening their binds, the eight's coming up as well. Okay, so crouch, everybody's set, second rows adjust, bind, front rows put their feet back, they're binding up onto the opposition, make sure they're not leaning in head on shoulder. You're gonna get some, some kind of engagement, but what you don't want is the full engagement so that there's no change between bind and set, you don't want that. And you don't want this prop putting weight onto the other, the opposing front row. And again, you can see that when this person's gonna be in a bit of a compromised position before you even set. And we'll get into positions again, as I said, but if you're gonna have this before you've even set the scrum, you're having an issue. Because before the set, everyone should look as good as they've ever had. So, everybody's nice and stable, and then you actually call the set. And they come together and there's a little as everybody settles. Then we're checking other parts, which we'll move on to. And balls in and we're ready to go. So that's your stability. Okay, everybody's aligned. We're all in our own channel space. We've got the perfect amount of space. We're not too close or too far apart. We are stable, holding our body weight. Our feet aren't moving and we're not leaning to the opposition. And now the last part of the setup, our binds, are our binds gonna be in the right spot? And how are the binds looking? How do they contribute to the big picture? All right, we're on to our next. We're gonna talk about binds. These are my beautiful drawings of players. No offense intended to anybody in the front row. I know they kind of look like turtles. Sorry. So with binds, our keys are up nice and high on the back. Think of the jersey. You want it right in the middle of the numbers. Now, realistically, you might not get that perfect picture every single time, depending on how flexible somebody's shoulder is, how big they are, how big their opponent is, how many bicep curls they've been doing that morning. I don't know. But we want that as our ideal picture, and so that's what we're gonna strive for. So on the bind, we're gonna have this red player reach up and try to grab that number. Likewise, we're gonna have that blue player reach up, try to grab that number. Fantastic. If we can keep that, that's great. When we set together, those arms will readjust because these players are actually coming together. Distance changes, fantastic. What we don't accept is if the hand actually moves and re-grips, unless it's to a better position. What do I mean by that? If I've got a hand up on the number and it's a great bind, and then we set together and that hand moves particularly to the side of the body or to the arm of the opponent, I am not happy with that bind. I'm not going to continue with that scrum. And if I see a picture like that when the scrum is set and going together, I will penalize it. Because what we don't want is the bind on the shoulder, on the sleeve, or on the side of the jersey with the elbow pointing down. So a good trigger is if I've got this player in our beautiful little positions again, this player, etc. Okay, the arms should be parallel to the scrum. So the arms should be nice and flat. If this blue player binds and has that elbow pointing down, Force goes down, elbow goes down, that scrum is gonna go down and it's gonna be the blue player's fault. So when we're checking the binds, we're checking that they're all up nice and high on the numbers. On that set, 
If they readjust to a better position, fantastic. But if they're readjusting to a worse position to try to take advantage of the opponent, that's a trigger. So you can reset if we haven't had the scrum yet, but if the scrum goes down and you've got that clear picture of an elbow pulling down, that's gonna be your culprit. All right, fantastic. So we've got our four steps for setting up a scrum. Our scrum is set up correctly and we are ready to move into the next part which is where all the action happens. This is a great time to pop in and talk about the global law trial, the break foot. So one, what is the break foot? World Rugby has put in a global law trial that hookers have to have a break foot out until the scrum sets together. So what's the break foot? Break foot is usually the striking foot out in the tunnel. So when you've got your scrums against each other, you have that little leg out from the hooker, little leg out from the hooker. Where everybody else's legs are all back, you're gonna see two feet in the middle of the tunnel until that set call when they can move it back. Now, what is the break foot for? The break foot is there to help give you a stable scrum. Because you have a support to all of that weight, theoretically, you should have a more stable scrum. And then when we set together, you've got something for all that weight to lean against. Exactly. Now the sanction for not having a break foot is a free kick. But what I want to challenge you as referees is the break foot is not a gotcha penalty. It's not something that you want to try to look for and penalize. The break foot is a great indicator that you can do more to help give you a stable scrum. But it's not the biggest cheating I've ever seen in the world. So that being said, as a referee, I'm not going to call the break foot unless I'm having issues in the scrums. If my scrums aren't stable and I've done all of my tips and tricks and I've tried to make sure the space is good, the alignment's good and I really can't get that stability, the break foot could be a great indicator. I'll go to the hookers, make sure you have your break foot fully out until that's set. That could fix all of my problems. But if I go out and I have scrums and I'm not having an issue all day, both teams, great job, super stable, fantastic scrummaging, and if you came to me with my film after and said, well, they never had a break foot out, honestly, I'm gonna say I don't really care because I didn't have an issue all day, but the break foot is a great way to help you get that stable scrum. So love a good global law trial. I love what the break foot is doing, but I'm not going to go out there and hunt for people that don't have their break foot because if they're still giving me a good stable scrum, happy days, play on. Okay. So we've hammered the setup of a scrum pretty hard. Why? I think it's the most important thing because if you set up a scrum well, you've set yourself up for the best possible opportunity to have good scrums. And if there are infringements, you've made it really easy to spot them because you've made everything really nice and clear. So pictures that are wrong will stand out. So you set the ball, crouch, find, set. Your scrum has come together. Once that ball is in, the mayhem starts. So what's happening in the scrum? Well, you've got the angles from your front row. And we're really gonna start with all the front row bits. We will get on to some of the back row bits, but, and I say this from the deepest part of my heart as mate, they don't really matter. This is where you're gonna get some of your biggest pictures. There are other things that can happen, but if you can really nail what's happening in the front row, you'll look like you know what you're doing at scrums. <laughs> Convince yourself you know what you're doing at scrums. So this is a perfect picture, nice spines, all driving straight. What can certain players do in the scrum to mess it up? Well, we could have a tight head angling in totally the theoretical thing for that to happen. So as you see, the spine will then 
be angled in. The hips will flare out. You could even have a step out. And that tight head is gonna be driving in on that hooker. So your hooker and your tight head are essentially just trying to beat up the opposition's team hooker. What's challenging about this picture is this is never the picture you're gonna get on the field because this loose head is trying to drive forward and guess what? There's nothing to drive against. So as an effect of this tight head angling in, this loose head is also gonna angle in because they're just trying to drive against a person. And when that person disappears, they then chase them in. Okay, fantastic. So you see that picture, well, who's at fault? Who did it first? A great telltale is who is moving forward. So if the red team has infringed, they're gonna get that drive on and your scrum is probably gonna be moving in that direction. So if that prop is dominant and cheating, your scrum's gonna move in that direction, that's a great tell that Yes, while they have a forward drive, it's not legal because of that angle that tight head is coming in on. Fantastic. So what, what else could happen? Well, you could theoretically have a loose head who wants to drive in. Now this is a really challenging thing for a loose head to do because they're trying to angle in the strongest part of the scrum because the tight head is scrumming against two people versus the loose head is just scrumming against one. So for them to completely flare their hips out and try to drive in, it's a big challenging ask, but totally doable. So if your loose head's gonna drive in on the tight head, the tight head is gonna do very similar to what they did before. They're also gonna get angled in because they're under pressure. But where's the scrum going? Well, likely it's going this direction because this is the menace that's causing the problem. This tight head under pressure could pop up because they have nowhere else to go because this hooker's driving forward, this tight head's driving forward and in, so they're gonna go up, down, they're gonna get out however they can because they're under a lot of pressure. But which way is the scrum driving might be a good indicator. Again, none of this is 100% because while they're doing whatever they're doing, we've got the same crap going on on the other side. And then you add in that you've got 500 pounds of locks driving through this hooker and this front row a lot of things can happen. So what I'm trying to give you today is just ideas of what pictures could look like. So, well, this is all very well and good. You just told us it could be a lot of things. I absolutely did, I'm a referee. What do I look for in a scrum to help me make decisions? I look for really good pictures and I reward those. So, I'm gonna look this red front row. Now a good picture for me is if this red front row has a good drive forward, but I wanna make sure these spines are in line the entire time. If these spines are nice and straight and the shoulders are all out and the scrum is moving forward, well, I'm gonna say they've done everything right and if something happens, it's gonna be the blue team's fault because they're showing me a perfect picture. So I go out in the field to reward perfect pictures, not to penalize bad pictures. So instead of looking for bad pictures, I look for good pictures. And if I see good pictures, I know those bad pictures are on the other side if an infringement happens. All right, so that's a bit about angles in the scrum. Let's talk about the difference between driving up and standing up.
We're gonna go back to our body shapes. There was our ideal body shape for a prop. So we have the little clock angle. If you look at the knee joint to the hip, that one o'clock on this side, right? One o'clock, but one o'clock is that perfect pushing angle. It's what we really like to see. So this would be the world's best scrum to have these front rows against each other. So driving up versus standing up. Again, I'm triggered in by perfect pictures. So I wanna see this prop moving that way. That looks a little angled down. I promise it's not. Nice and straight. So I wanna see that prop moving at that plane, not moving straight up. So in the difference between driving up and standing up, the motions will look different. If this prop is dominant and this one is standing up under pressure, your movement pattern is gonna look like this. Whoop. Because we were happy, happy, happy until there was somebody under pressure who stood up and there was nothing to push against anymore. Now, the difference to that would be if you've got a prop who's standing up. And a prop who's standing up is gonna go straight up. So our finishing pictures might look the same but again, I'm rewarding that clear forward drive. If I see a really nice picture, all those spines and lines that we talked about before, driving nice and straight forward, and then something goes wrong, I'm gonna reward that team that's showing me the perfect picture. Hopefully that makes sense. Because this prop is gonna end up in the same position either way they're gonna be stood up. So it's really important to know what leads to it and what the picture looks like before it. Because if you just look at end pictures, you're just gonna be guessing as a referee because the end picture usually looks the same. We talked about that with our angles. Those end pictures, both props look the same. What happens when you start? Who's in a better position when you start? Who shows you? the picture that you wanna see who shows you that nice square forward drive. And then that will tell you who's the one not showing you a great picture at the end. Another thing that can happen, we talked about the scrum having a different, going across, having an angle. We talked about the scrum going up. Let's talk about the scrum collapsing. So a collapse scrum happens all the time. I'm guilty of it as well. You just kind of poke the balls at the back so you can play away. But remember, we talked about the scrum being a contest. We talked about the front rows and the forwards really wanting to show their dominance and contest for that ball. So I'm gonna give you a couple of tricks of what could happen on a collapse scrum. So you've got this nice middle line. This is where you've set your mark and each team is on their side of the line. The middle line is also a great indicator if you've got what we call over leaning, and that'll happen in the bind. Over leaning will happen when the teams come down in the bind phase. If one team is way further over the line than the other team, that would like this red team, if they were in this space, they've gone over that line and they're encroaching on blue's territory. It's gonna make it a lot harder for blue to set because red is already over leaning and taking up all that space. That's a free kick. So we've got this line that can help with some things in the setup. The line can also help once you engage on the scrum and it goes down. Very similar to the up and the angle pictures, they're both gonna look the same at the end and you're gonna have someone who looks like a pancake. So the question is, is whose fault is it that somebody lost their footing? Again, we're looking for these really strong angles. If one player is maintaining these angles, it's probably not their fault. So what could we have? Well, we could have somebody with their legs out too long. So when they set together, this person's probably gonna fall flat on their face because there's no way 
that they're going to be able to maintain a strong body position when their legs are all the way out. And so they're just going to go down. Now when they go down, obviously they're bound up. And so what's this person going to do? Also go down, right? And so we talked about, you've got to get the setup. You've got to get your pictures and you have to see what happens because you're going to look at the resulting picture and it's going to look the same. Both teams are going to go down. So we look at that leg, make sure we've got that nice strong angle. If not, this is what could happen. Now what if we have too short of an angle, somebody bent and all engaged up? Well, they're gonna have a really hard time getting the core strength to engage and drive across. So on the engage, what's likely to happen is this person's gonna crumble up and they're gonna fold in and go down. Now when they fold in and go down under pressure, they're gonna be taking away space, which means this person is gonna overextend and pancake. So resulting picture, they're gonna look like a pancake. Now we just said, pancake guy was at fault the other time. Why is, why is pancake guy not at fault this time? A trick, and I got this from JP Doyle, so if you don't like it, don't blame me, it's him, is looking at this line, is who won the game line? If I have everyone set up with a lot of really nice space here and I'm seeing this bad picture from red. Red is going to fall back on their side of the gain line. Blue is going to go over the gain line and end up pancaking over here. So blue's over the line because it's red's fault that they came down. Now remember, this all depends on if we've got that really good space because if blue was over leaning and goes down, it's gonna be the same resulting picture. So that's why it's really important to make sure you've got a good setup. Likewise, if red has a really long body picture and we're on our each side of our line to start, so we've got a good starting picture, on that engage, Red's gonna be overextended and it's gonna fall down, you guessed it, on their side of the line. Because they're overextended, they don't have anywhere else to go. Blue, likewise, is gonna end up falling down over on the other side of the line because red has just fallen back. Because they're already fully extended, they're just gonna poop down. And so blue's gonna have that little bit of space as well. So whose fault is it? Who's got the worst body position? A key might be, if you've started and gotten that good space, is who's over the line. Who's over the line has probably won that space and is probably not at fault. But in the scrum, there's no guarantees. All right, so I did promise you that there are five other people in the scrum and they matter too. All forwards matter. So we're gonna talk about some of the things that they can do that's illegal. So what we're gonna focus on here is what's called a whip wheel. Now, when a scrum wheels, it means that it moves at an angle. A whip wheel means that there's no forward drive and that thing just yoinks around. Yes, that's a technical term. Please add it to the law book, yoinks. So what can happen in a whip wheel is if red is putting the ball in, they want to drive that way. It's a perfect picture if they drive that way. So blue, who's going to be our legal team here, is going to whip wheel it. Once that ball comes in, we're going to have these back row players all step to the left. Yes, they're going to step out to the left. Now what's going to happen when they step out to the left and one angle is hip out to the left is the scrum is going to go woof -a and it's going to spin on its axis. Why? Because red has nothing to push against and all of them have just yoinked out that way. So it's gonna be, this is really dangerous because all of the weight that's in that scrum is trying to move forward and then it's just spun. So all of those players, their necks are gonna be really yoinked and it's all bad. So a key thing that you can see for this picture 
is the first motion that these players make is they step out into the side. What we want to see, remember we're rewarding perfect pictures, good pictures, is we want to see those players driving forward. If the first steps that they're taking are backward or to the side, that's illegal. So a scrum can theoretically go out and we see it all the time. It gets that wheel motion, but a whip wheel is incredibly dangerous because the first thing that the offending team have done is step out to the side. I'll show you some pictures on that. So here we have a great example of a whip wheel. The team in black is the one putting the ball into the scrum. The team in white is on defense. And what you're going to see is once the ball is in, there's no clear forward drive by the white team. Instead, the back five all steps out to the right and the scrum spins on its axis. So we're going to slow that down a bit. The teams engage. And remember, we're trying to reward good pictures. So if white gives us a clear drive forward, happy days. But instead, we've got no drive forward, ball is in, and all of those white players start stepping to the side and just pulling out. So this is what we call a whip wheel and we're looking to penalize the white team. All right, so that has been basically a good starting lesson on the scrum. Scrums are really complicated and especially at the highest levels, everybody's cheating. So it's just who's doing it better and who's more likely to get away with it. So what we talked about and my biggest things for you to take away from this is in the scrum, your number one priority is always safety. If at any point the players are unsafe, you have to blow that scrum up. If you don't have the correct infringement or whatever, that's fine. Reset the scrum, keep the players safe. Second, what you can control as a referee is get a good setup. Make sure you take the time to get the alignment, get the space, get the stability, have good pictures on your vines, and set yourself up for success at the scrum. You work hard at that scrum setup, everything after that will be a lot easier. And then the last thing is once the scrum started, reward good pictures. Go out there as a referee and try to reward a team that's playing really, really well, as opposed to trying to see which team is cheating or doing a worse job. If you can reward a good picture at the scrum, everyone will be able to follow your decisions, the teams will have trust in you, and you'll have a great day out on the pitch. That's all for me at Scrum and the Set Piece. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you took something out of this. Our next training is going to be next week, May 31st. It's a Wednesday line out in mall. Stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to learn more about the Scrum. This was our fourth session. We've got two left, line out and foul play. Massive thanks to the Seattle Sea Wolves and the Pacific Northwest Rugby Referee Society for letting me put these presentations on. Hopefully you found something valuable and stay tuned for the last two.